Good morning, beautiful people. It's good to be with you. Good to have an opportunity to worship the one whose love has never failed us yet, Jesus the Christ. My name is Sam Parks, and as part of my uh, service to God through Mary Esther United Methodist Church, I get to be the pastor. It's great to be with you and to have this opportunity for worship with you. Uh, a couple of announcements. Um, you might be suffering a little bit of whiplash. <laughs> Worship whiplash? I don't know if that's a thing. Um, you can tell me, though. Uh, you know, over the course of these last several weeks, we've been experimenting as a staff with several different styles. Um, we started off with a fully produced, uh, staged worship. Um, and last week and this week, we have opted to pare down to something that's a little bit smaller, uh, a little bit more compact experience. And uh, some of you have wondered why we're doing that. Well, because we've been trying to hear what you're telling us through our analytics on YouTube and Facebook Live. And that is that, um, you know, uh, uh, some of you hang in with a worship service that is an hour in length uh, all the way through, but not many do. Uh, most people will come in and they um, are, are staying with us for a portion of the worship service and then uh, they have to move on to other things. And that's understandable. Um, when you're in a sanctuary and you don't have any other outside uh, stimuli that can distract your attention from what's happening in worship, then it's a little easier to hang in for an hour. Um, but when you're in your own home worshiping, as we all are right now, then life is... Um, Life tends to uh, kind of crawl in around the edges and distract us. Uh, we have dogs, we have cats, we have kids, we have doorbells that ring and laundry that has to be done, and there are lots of things. So we're trying to produce a, a worship service right now um, that is um, honed down to sort of some essential things um, and hope that there are other offerings that we can make that can help uh, to connect with you in different kinds of ways that we might be able to do through the week. Um, but we also don't need to just guess what you're thinking. Um, we uh, are going to be sending out a link in the coming week that will uh, give you an opportunity to take a survey that can give you an opportunity to feed back to us. What is it? What are the things about our worship services that you've really loved? And what are the things that, well, that you haven't connected with as well? We would love to hear those. It will help us do the best job we can of crafting worship experiences that are meaningful uh, for you in a time of real difficulty. Um, if you'll go to www.maryesterumc.org, you can click on our Welcome Center and online campus, and there you will find several things. There's a link to our YouTube channel, and then there's also... Um, uh, um, a button to push to see our worship bulletin for Sunday, then there is a place where you can register your attendance. I really encourage you to do that. We've had a great time seeing all the different places and people that um, have chosen to register their attendance with us. We've had folks from other countries even that have done that, and it's been fantastic. Uh, it, it really helps us to know and to be able to report what's happening in our church during um, these days of closure. As well, there is a uh, prayer request uh, button there that you can share with us the things that are weighing down your heart, things that we can be in prayer with you about, or joys that you have. We would love to be able to just rejoice uh, with all that God is doing in your life and the ways that you are experiencing the blessing of God and uh, the ways you want to express your gratitude during this season. That would be fantastic, too. Then you'll also see other announcements and our published prayer list that we have there so that you can be in prayer with us. And now it is time to seek that center, find uh, the quiet center of our souls and invite God uh, to come into our lives and our hearts, open our eyes, minds, hearts, and spirits so that we can hear with joy what God is saying to us today. And now let us worship God as James leads us in a familiar hymn 
that can help us to um, begin to rejoice in that blessed assurance that we have from the one whose love has never failed us yet, Jesus the Christ. Good morning, family. This is a day that the Lord has made. We choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, thank you for joining us in our broadcast and our worship service this morning. Um, as we begin to sing praise unto God, I want you to go ahead and take this opportunity to sing loud and proud. You're in your own homes. And let's, uh, I can't hear you anyway, but let God hear your heart. <laughs> All right. And don't make me sing by myself. Blessed assurance is where we're going to start today. Won't you join us? women proclaimed the good news of Jesus' resurrection, and the world was changed forever. Teach us to keep faith with them, that our witness may be as bold, our love is deep, and our faith is true. Amen. We are enjoying a worship series called Form, Inform, Reform, and Transform. Um, these readings all come from the second chapter of Acts, and what we're trying to explore together is, are, are the implications of the resurrection for us. 
In other words, what does the the resurrection isn't just a neat thing that happened that proves that God is powerful, um, but that the resurrection has direct meaning for us and for the kind of community that God is trying to shape. So um, last week we heard the first or one portion of Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost, and now we are going to hear um, the last portion of it. So this is from Acts 2. We're going to begin with the first half of the 14th verse and then move down to the 32nd verse. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. This Jesus God raised up, and of that all of us are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he He has poured poured out this that you both see and hear. For For David David did not ascend ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, Now, when they they heard this, they were were cut to the heart and and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Word Word of of God, God, word of life. life. Thanks Thanks be to to God. Have you ever had an aha moment? Like one of those just searing moments where all of a sudden the information that you have received adds up and sends your life in a different kind of trajectory than it would have before? Oh my gosh, it's, it's, it's something that we see in movies all the time. Like in the Disney movie, The Lion King, that moment where Simba uh, realizes who he is and what his life is about. Or maybe it's <laughs> that uh, moment in the movie, The Sixth Sense, You know, the M. Night Shyamalan movies have a lot of aha moments. Moments where all of the truth gets told and you suddenly are invited to understand this whole thing in a different way. And in the sixth sense, Bruce Willis comes to understand himself in a radically different way toward the end of that movie. And it changes everything. It changes your perspective. Now, I don't have just huge, big, aha moments all the time. But boy, haven't we had some lately. I mean, those moments where we suddenly realize that, uh, boy, I, I, I can choose to live in a very different way than what I was living before. <laughs> moments when we suddenly realize that, oh, I can live inside the house without going outside for a long, long time. People will bring all the things that I need right here to the house, and I can do this. This is a moment, it's a time in the culture where we're sort of invited to learn a lot about ourselves. And if you're like me, you might not like everything that you're finding on that interior journey. I've certainly found out how 
impatient I am. Just ask my kids. <laughs> um, I've discovered I've discovered how uh, easily I can get frustrated or dejected. Uh, everything seems just kind of hyper emotional right now for me, and I have certainly discovered how extroverted I am because you know I I just roam around kind of looking for people to connect with. Last night, I was spending a little time with a good friend, and at the end of our time together, uh, we both just simultaneously stuck out our hands and shook hands with each other, and were shocked in that moment, <laughs> realizing that we probably shouldn't have done that, but wow, how good that felt just to have that connection with another person. It's an aha moment. Here in the book of Acts, there are a lot of people having aha moments. <laughs> and what contributes to it, what leads up to it, is Peter's definition of it, exactly who people are, who his listeners are, and who God is. Last week we heard um, the, the, we heard, you know, Peter inform people. Give them the information, the truth about themselves. This Jesus, whom you crucified, God has raised and made Lord of all. Whom you crucified. That's how he ends his sermon today. And what happens? An aha moment. The scriptures say they were cut to the heart. I don't know when the last time was that you were cut to the heart, but that's a deep feeling. It's a, it's a moment of real recognition, of self-recognition. They are, they're having an aha moment, a conversion moment. And it's not just a few. Scriptures tell us it was 3,000 people all at once. Now that's pretty amazing, considering that the source of their aha moment was a sermon. <laughs> I'm not sure that I'm expecting the same result today, and that's probably a good thing. But that just lets you know. And when you read Peter's sermon, you know, you think to yourself, I don't think it was the quality of Peter's preaching. And I'm not sure that it was the availability to repent <laughs> on the part of his hearers. It's just the work of the Holy Spirit. It's just this moment where everything comes together and God chooses to do this thing. And what is it that God chooses to do? They ask themselves, having been cut to the heart, what do we do? How do we respond to this? What, how do we behave? And Peter gives a really interesting answer. He says, you know, what you really need to do is to repent. <laughs> repent. You know, we don't use those words an awful lot in United Methodist churches. Words like sin and judgment and confession, repentance, those kinds of things. Um... In fact, we just don't talk about them very much at all. But the truth of the matter is, you know, we're, we're pretty sinful people. What is unique about these people, this group of thousands of folks, is that what they do is own for themselves the crucifixion of Jesus. Isn't that something that that, that Peter tells them, you are the ones who crucified Jesus. Now, this was weeks after the crucifixion. I'm sure it's not like the same group of people was there. It's, it's, it's like this moment where everyone who is listening to him is sort of brought to the cross and finds themselves at that point knowing that it was their lives 
that brought God to this point, that caused Jesus to go to this length to show them the love of God. It's not like they actually had the hammer and nails in their own hand, but apparently it feels like the weight of that hammer is there. Have you ever felt that before? Have you ever felt like have you ever felt the, the conviction or kind of the judgment of God gazing in upon your soul saying, friend, you're the reason this happened. You are the source <laughs> and, and the uh, aim. You are both the source and the aim of the crucifixion of Jesus. That's hard news. But sometimes I think that we can't really rejoice in the grace of God, the commitment of God, the utter commitment, the, 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 the determination of God to give us the gift of new life in the resurrection. I don't think we can embrace that gift until we have felt the the guilt and the shame of our own participation in that process. It's hard to think about. It's difficult. But apparently this day, 3,000 people own for themselves, they appropriate both the crucifixion and then Peter advises them to take a second step, to repent and be baptized, to be born anew. You know, in, in prior epidemics in Europe, say, in the, in the uh, early days of the church or in the, in the Middle Ages, uh, you know, they're, they're, the church has been through this before, right? It's not like the church hasn't been through epidemics before. Um, through the plagues and the Black Death, etc., in in Europe, there are lots of wonderful, amazing Christian writers um, whose work parallels uh, these times of difficulty. Julian of Norwich, who is one of my absolute favorites, uh, she is uh, she is writing in the time of uh, of epidemics and plagues in um, medieval England, and. It's in the midst of that that she has this vision of God, you know, holding the world in the palm of his hand. And she affirms that, you know, all things shall be well. All manner of things shall be well. It's going to be okay, in other words. Christians have been through pandemics and epidemics before. And almost always... Um, uh, they, they don't necessarily interpret that God causes the pandemic, but it's still an opportunity for repentance. Boy, don't we have a lot of extra time on our hands right now where we could actually sit and do some introspection, think about our lives, think about what, what it is that, that God wants with our life, um, and, and do some repenting. Now, you might think of repenting as sort of uh, merely feeling sorry for yourself or, or confessing to God what you've done wrong. And uh, you wouldn't be wrong if you thought that, but it's not merely that. The, the word that Peter uses in his sermon, um, metanoia, is the Greek word or the Greek concept, and it means to change the way you think. Change, change your, your mindset. Has, have you been available for God to help you change your mindset, the way that you think about things? What Peter promises, or what God promises through Peter, 
is that God offers pardon. God offers forgiveness. And that is one of the ways in which God is shaping, forming the people. God is, is kind of reforming people, taking the, um, you know, uh, the, the, the clay, the raw materials of human beings, 3,000 of them this day, and reforming them, reshaping them into a people that really love God and love one another. So uh, that's happening through pardon, but it, there's a second thing that God, um, that, that Peter promises. It's not only pardon, but he promises power. Power. Power to live in, in a way that is truly pleasing. You know, power to behave in, in ways that, that show love of God and love of neighbor in a really thoroughgoing way. Good friends, I just want you to hear that this is a time. This, this pandemic is a time for us to think about these things in a really deep, considerate way. What are we going to do? Just Netflix and chill? Or could we take this opportunity to do some reading, to read the Bible, read the scriptures, think together, uh, um, discern really who we are, to own for ourselves the crucifixion of Jesus, but then also to feel the forgiveness of God and to know God's utter commitment and determination to create a different kind of community. Not the one we had before. And I can almost guarantee that'll be the case. But not only to give us pardon, but to give us power, possibility, um, energy, uh, the capacity to love like we've never loved before. To, to um, it, embrace the concerns of God in a way like we've never done before. The promise is for you, says Peter. It's for you. It's for me. It's for your children. It's for my children. It's for everyone who is far off. The promise. The promise is for everyone. God is calling us all to himself. And even in the midst of this, you know, when we see these uh, tremendous acts of grace that are being bestowed around the world from health workers and from first responders, from, uh, you know, uh, teachers, homeschooling parents who are somehow finding in their hearts an extra reservoir of patience to deal with their kids. <laughs> there are lots of signs of the resurrection and empowerment that are going on inside our communities all the time. This is the time, friends. This is the time when God can form us as individuals, but God can also form us as a church into something new something new. This is a moment of reformation. It's a moment of reshaping. It's an aha moment. It's a moment of, of learning something so clearly about ourselves that we just hadn't thought of before. And it's a moment when that recognition leads us into a new direction. I can just feel it. I can just feel it. I just know it's coming. And I can't wait to be back together again with you. But until then, until then, let us think and let us pray and let us discern and let us, uh, let us hear what God wants us to hear. It may not be easy to hear it, but God provides a pathway towards something new, to repent 
and be baptized or to remember our baptism and to know that the grace of God has showered upon us in ways that we could never provide for ourselves and which could never empower us to be who God really created us to be. I just believe that. I love you deeply, and I can't wait to see you again. And so now, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us go forth with joy to, um, to, to have our minds opened up to all that God wants us to see and hear. Now, as we uh, get ready to move in toward, toward the end of our worship time, we don't have a traditional time of offering, but if you go to our website, www.maryesterumc.org, uh, you will find there a, a, giving, a Give Now button that's part of our online uh, campus. And uh, we are so grateful for all the ways that you have been supporting the ministry of Mary Esther United Methodist Church, even in these weird and difficult days. Uh, we are deeply grateful for all you have done. And if God, God is leading you to continue to give uh, to him through our church, then that is one way that you can do that. Or, of course, you can always send us a check in the mail, and we will make sure that that gets uh, to all the right people in all the right places. So now um, we have experienced that blessed assurance from God. And now let's, and I, I look forward to James leading us in this next song. Um, this next song is very special to me. I grew up um, in a small town in Tennessee that didn't have... <laughs> doesn't have all that rich a history, but here's one thing. Um, the, the author of this song, the composer, um, uh, was a famous gospel musician, and in 1939, um, he wrote this song, and it was first published by the James D. Vaughn Publishing Company in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, my little hometown. In a, little, uh, in a little book called Gospel Choruses. It's the first time it was ever printed. And it came from my hometown. It is a song that will probably be very familiar to you called Victory in Jesus. Well, we're back again. And it's time to lift up another song in praise. Uh, the song we're about to sing is Victory in Jesus. Um, it reminds me of a, a game I used to play when I was a kid. It was called Follow the Leader. As long as you did everything that the leader did, you could stay in the game. So I want you to think about that as you sing this song, that every victory that you seek after has only been won by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He said it is finished. It's a done deal. You are more than an overcomer. So your victory lies in him. Do what he does. Say what he says and receive his victory. It belongs to you.
people go forth rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit to not only give you pardon for all that you have done and said and left undone and unsaid, but uh, also to give you power to do and say all the things that God has created you to do and say. And as you do it, know that the promise is for you. It is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for everyone that God is calling to himself. And do it with the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let all God's people say, Amen. I look forward to seeing you very soon. But until then, James, sing us out. Well, we have come to the end of another worship service together. And um, I remember when I was a kid that we all would gather around the television. and um, I used to love the ending of the Carol Burnett show. I'm so glad we had this time together. That's my heart towards you right now. But our, we're not going to end on that song. But we are going to actually sing God is Good. And it's simply just a song or a prayer that we pray over one another as we depart. Uh, from this worship time or experience together that just keep us knitted together at heart. So hopefully by the time we all come back together this will be a song that's burned on our hearts and it will just flow out of our mouths when we assemble and, and declare together in one sanctuary underneath one roof that God is good. Here we go. Mm -hmm.